starting with the definition, amphalocele is a congenital abdominal wall defect. And regarding the congenital abdominal wall defects in pediatrics, we have two. We have the gastroschisis, which we already explained in the previous video. And we also have the amphalocele, which will we explain in this video. So in the amphalocele, the abdominal viscera is herniating through a defect in the abdomen, specifically through the umbilical cord to the outside environment. And since the viscera is herniating through the umbilical cord, the viscera will be covered by a sac, which will be the umbilical cord lining. As you can see in this picture, so there is abdominal viscera herniating through a defect and the viscera is covered by the umbilical cord lining. And the location of the amphalocele defect could be mid-abdominal, hypogastric, or epigastric. And if we compare it to the gastroschisis, the location of the defect in the gastroschisis will be almost always to the right of the umbilicus. And the amphalocele sac comprised of an inner peritoneal layer and an outer amnion layer with the Wharton's jelly in between. And the most commonly organs herniating through this defect are the intestine, the stomach, and the liver. Moving on to the epidemiology, the amphalocele incidence is around 1 in 1500 in 14 to 18 weeks of gestation and 1 in 5000 at birth. And the difference of incidence between the 14 to 18 weeks and at birth is coming from that the amphalocele cases discovered early will be spontaneously last or the pregnancy is terminated. And incidence of the amphalocele remained stable in comparison with the gastroschisis incidence, which is increasing. And the gastroschisis incidence right now is around 1 in 2,500 births. And the amphalocele has relatively high incidence of other congenital anomalies by 50 to 70% of the cases. If you compare it to the gastroschisis, in gastroschisis, only 10% of the cases will have associated congenital anomalies, while in amphalocele, it is 50 to 70%. And the associated anomalies include cardiac anomalies, gastrointestinal anomalies, exotrophy of the bladder, neural tube defects, and lung hypoplasia, and much more. And the amphalocele can be associated with several syndromes, including the Beckwith-Wideman syndrome, the pentology of control, and the trisomies 13, 18, and 21. Regarding the Beckwith-Wideman syndrome, it's a rare syndrome that include findings like an amphalocele, a macroglossia. Macroglossia is a bigger tongue, so the baby tongue will be big, and the baby will have organomegaly, hypoglycemia, and there is increased risk of Willem's tumor, hepatoblastoma, and neuroblastoma in the future life. Regarding the pentology of control, we have five different findings in this syndrome. So we have an amphalocele, a diaphragmatic hernia, cardiac anomalies, a pericardial defect, and a sternal cleft. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology. So the pathophysiology of the amphalocele is related to the embryonic folding. And the embryonic folding is the process by which the fetus converts from flat sheet of cells into a tube-like structure and it starts at four weeks. So the fetus would convert from a flat sheet of cells like that and into a tube-like structure. And when this process gets completed, the visual organs, as you can see here, will be covered by the abdominal wall. So the embryonic folding has to be complete for the abdominal wall to close. If not, 
then amphalocele or gastroschisis will develop because the gastroschisis have the same pathophysiology as the amphalocele. If the deficit in the embryonic folding process was related to the cranial fold, then the amphalocele would be associated with cranial fold defects like diaphragmatic hernia, cardiac anomalies, pericardial defects, and sternal cleft. But if the deficit is related to the caudal fold, then the amphalocele might be associated with the bladder exotrophy. The amphalocele cause is unknown, but there is risk factors for that. Risk factors include genetic predisposition and chromosomal abnormalities and maternal age of 35 years and older and maternal use of salicylates like aspirin and some other drugs and maternal diabetes and finally maternal cigarette smoking or alcohol or illicit drug use. Now let's talk about the diagnosis. So the amphalocele can be diagnosed by routine two-dimensional ultrasound evaluation by 18 weeks of gestation, but first trimester detection is possible only with three-dimensional ultrasound. And elevation of maternal serum alpha fetoprotein is the present in most cases of the amphalocele, same with gastroschisis. Gastroschisis can be differentiated from amphalocele by the ultrasound too. In gastroschisis, there is lack of membrane covering the bowel, while in amphalocele, there is. And in amphalocele, there is high probability of cardiovascular, central nervous system, and genitourinary anomalies. 70% of these anomalies can be detected by ultrasound thus knowing the survival rate. Because the survival rate is highly hindered by these anomalies, especially the cardiac anomalies. In comparison with the gastroschisis, there is low probability for GIT, CNS, CVS, and musculoskeletal and genitourinary anomalies. So after we diagnosed the amphalocele, the next step is the delivery of the amphalocele baby. And the goal is to deliver the amphalocele patient as close to term as possible to maximize the fetal growth and the lung development. Spontaneous vaginal delivery is the preferred since the C-section delivery has not shown any advantage by many studies. But many neonates with giant amphalocele continue to be delivered by the C-section delivery in many centers worldwide. And giant amphalocele is when the abdominal wall defect is larger than 3 cm and the herniating viscera must contain the liver to be called giant amphalocele. Now after we delivered the amphalocele baby, now comes the resuscitation steps. So after delivery of amphalocele newborn, ventilation or intubation might be needed. And the blood glucose is checked immediately and the dextrose might be given if it was low because remember in back with Weidman syndrome, the infant has hypoglycemia and nasogastric decompression tube should be inserted and intravenous access is obtained. Thorough search for associated anomalies is important. The infant is sent for a chest x-ray looking for elongated thorax, which indicates pulmonary hyperplasia, and the infant is also sent for echocardiography looking for cardiac anomalies. The amphalocele sac should be covered with saline-soaked gauze and rest to minimize fluid losses and bolus intravenous normal saline 20 ml per kilogram after delivery might be needed to substitute the third space fluid loss that are coming from the displaced abdominal organs 
and the insensible fluid losses and the fluid and temperature losses in amphalocele are much less than with gastrous cases because in amphalocele there is a cover covering these organs so there is less fluid and temperature lost. Initial dose of ampicillin and gentamicin shortly after delivery to prevent GIT infections is administered and parenteral nutrition is very important in amphalocele and should be used until the bowel function goes back to normal. So after we delivered the amphalocele baby and we resuscitated them, now we do a risk assessment for them. So risk is assessed based on the presence of associated anomalies and isolated amphalocele with no associated anomalies has the best survival rate of 90% which is similar to the survival rate of the gastrous cases and the presence of associated anomalies decreases the survival and amphalocele can be classified into hypogastric central and epigastric as we mentioned before and the epigastric amphalocele has the worst survival rate because of the presence of the cardiac anomalies now let's move on to the treatment so the treatment is with surgery and the goal is to return the intestine back to the abdominal cavity and slowly introduce the feeding to the baby and the treatment options depend on the size of the amphalocele, baby's gestational age, and the presence of associated comorbidities like respiratory insufficiency and the presence of associated anomalies like the cardiac anomalies. So we have to take all of these into account in choosing the treatment option. And the treatment options include primary closure of the defect, delayed closure of the defect and stage closure of the defect. Primary closure is used in small amphalocele's that are less than 3 cm in diameter and the delayed closure is used when the patient has giant amphalocele or the patient has small amphalocele with associated comorbidities and stage closure is used when the patient with large defects and no associated comorbidities. Starting with the primary closure, the immediate primary closure consists of excision of the amphalocele sac, reduction of the, its content, and umbilical cord is dissected and ligated, and the closure of fascia and skin over the abdominal content is done. And the primary closure is used for small defects, less than 3 cm in diameter as we mentioned, and larger defects that are easy to close in case of minimal loss in abdominal domain also can be treated by primary closure in the first month of life. Regarding delayed closure, delayed closure is used when the patient has giant amphalocele or has small amphalocele with associated comorbidities or associated anomalies. And this method include umbilical cord ligation and excision and the defect is then addressed daily with topical sulfa salazine non-adherent dressing and with time the amnion become epithelized and the defect size decreases and in around one to two years when the comorbidities have improved and the defect size decreased then the definitive closure can be performed. So the idea behind the delayed closure is that we take care of the amphalocele sac until there is epithelium is developing over it so it becomes smaller which make it easy to close later. Regarding the stage closure, it is used in patients with large defects and no associated comorbidities. So when there is significant loss in the abdominal domain of the abdominal cavity, the primary closure is not possible because it leads to abdominal compartment syndrome because when we force those visceral organs into the abdomen which has a small abdominal domain this will increase the pressure 
leading to abdominal compartment syndrome. So that is why we use the stage closure in that case. And stage closure is done using the amniotic sac inversion technique. Now let's talk about the amniotic sac inversion technique. So all of the amnion inversion procedure is done extra peritoneal and there is less risk of future adhesions and intestinal obstruction with this method because the operation will be extra peritoneal so this will help in preventing adhesions and intestinal obstruction in the future. So the first step is that the amnion is inverted by attaching a silastic silo to the amnion skin junction using sutures. The silastic silo is a silicone bag that will be attached to the edges of the amnion skin uh, junctions that will help in a reduction of the amphalocele sac. So the bowel and liver are progressively reduced into the abdomen and the intra-abdominal pressure is monitored using an NG tube and it should not exceed 20 millimeters mercury to prevent the abdominal compartment syndrome. And reduction progresses on a daily basis until the contents lays flat and that is when the silo is removed and then the amnion is pulled and detachment of intestine is done from the amnion then it is inverted back and the edges are approximated and this process is repeated multiple times until simulated total closure of the abdominal wall is possible and when that possible then the amnion is inverted and dissection of the amnion is done and the abdomen is a closed. Finally, let's talk about the complications of the amphalocele. So early complications include pulmonary hypoplasia and a chronic lung disease, and those are due to the amphalocele disease process. We also have cholestasis, sepsis, developmental delay, hypotonia, respiratory insufficiency, renal failure, and abdominal compartment syndrome and those come as a result from the treatment of the amphalocele. Light complications of the amphalocele include hernia and gastroesophageal reflux disease due to the increased abdominal pressure. And with that we reach the end of this video. Thank you guys for watching. Please support this video by liking and commenting your ideas and questions. And this video is a part of a bigger class. It's called the Pediatric Surgery Masterclass that will be appearing right now.